Hello, and welcome to another episode of Boundless Body Radio. I'm your host, Casey Ruff, and today we have another amazing guest to reintroduce to you today. Nicola Rond is a returning guest on our show. Be sure to check out her first appearance on our podcast on episode 248 of Boundless Body Radio. Nicole has been a licensed mental health counselor in Washington State for over 15 years. Her current practice focuses on helping clients with anxiety, depression, and other mental health issues to transition to a ketogenic diet and uses other nutritional therapies to complement their psychotherapy work. She holds several specialized training certifications, allowing her to work with underlying biological factors and mental illness. Nicole works with clients via telehealth and helps people explore medication-free options for their mental health using research and evidence-based nutritional and functional psychiatry so that people can get their lives back without the side effects or dependence on Big Pharma. In 2021, she created mentalhealthketo.com, a website devoted to educating people about ketogenic diets for mental health and neurological issues. You can find her all over social media, spreading the good news about keto as an option to treat mental illness. Nicole Laurent, what an absolute honor it is to welcome you back to Boundless Body Radio. Thanks for having me again. I love it here. Oh, we love you here. You are fantastic. You got so excited last time. It was so much fun to interview you. I know how passionate you are about this. And so we are just so excited to host you back on the show. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Um, so I'm going to, I want to dive into your story a bit more than we did last time. I felt like, um, you know, we kind of covered what, the things that you had gone through, but, but, but there's a lot more that I think you'd actually had to get through to get to where you are today. And I'd love to cover that. But before we do, I just want to comment on something that I find kind of, it, it's kind of funny, but it's like, the more you think about it, it's really not funny. And it's a normalization of certain things that we see around us. And we see it so frequently, we normalize it, but we don't realize it's not normal. And so we come up with these weird terms, like hanger is now actually in a dictionary. That's a word now. It's something that somebody made up and now it's a word. Or things like dad bod. We just think like, oh, we've got kids. He's 35. Of course, he's got a belly. He's 50 pounds overweight. You know, my joints are creaky and I forget things. And one of the ones that I always think about is <laughs> completely completely just left my mind was brain fog brain fog is this term that we throw around we just say it's kind of normalized uh most people experience it maybe they experience it at work or forgetfulness where like they forget their keys somewhere or you know, all, those, all these things that again are not normal but we normalize them what do you what do you think of when you hear those terms yeah so brain fog Brain fog is this kind of umbrella term that we use to describe our brain not working very well in a lot of different ways. Um, and no one wants to walk around saying my brain is unhealthy um, or my brain is, has a neurodegenerative process going on that's slowly taking away my ability to function. <laughs> I mean, you know, nobody, nobody wants to talk about that. Um, and everybody wants to kind of say, oh, you know, it's because I didn't sleep well, or it's because of, of this or that. And it can absolutely be a sleep issue. But there's also kind of something going on um, that I see that kind of that, that I think is kind of concerning. And, and that is when patients or people go into their doctor and they're like, I'm forgetting things. I've got some brain fog. Um, they're getting mental health diagnoses. and Brain fog mood issues are, of course, a part of brain fog symptoms, because if your brain fog is happening in your, your prefrontal cortex, right, your frontal lobe, then it doesn't work very well. And one of the purposes of your frontal lobe is to allow you to regulate your emotions. So instead of the doctors looking at, oh, you've got brain fog. So it's not just that you're sad, it's that there's all these other cognitive symptoms going on. And sometimes the patient will say, no, it's not just sad. It's like this, 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 and this, right? I can't, I'm, you know, some people will kind of have trouble finding their words. Like I can't retrieve my words or I can't drive any place newish without, um, or without the, the Google lady telling me where to turn. Right. Um, or, you know, I went to my friend's house twice, but I couldn't find it again with, without the Google lady, right? Stuff like that. Like they'll, they'll talk about that and they'll be concerned and they'll be like, something's wrong with my brain. Right. And they're, they're getting mental health diagnoses and, and it's fine to have a mental health diagnosis, but when 
as a society, when everything you Google about that mental health diagnosis tells you that it is a chronic and unremitting lifelong illness that you're never going to get better from or that there's no real therapies for other than medication, I have a huge problem with that. Because every day in my practice and in my brain fog recovery program, I see people who get their brain back. And, and as a result, their mood improves and their mental health improves hugely. Um, and it was very clearly a cognitive issue. Like when we look at their symptoms altogether, it is more cognitive than mood for sure. Wow. Um, it's so, something yeah. I notice all the time with the people I work with. I don't even specialize in mental health and I see it all the time. It's across the board. People report that they have not only more energy physically, but mentally. They don't, mm -hmm. they don't get tired in a work day. They, they have, you know, they've got the, the mental acuity to have difficult conversations or really focus on their work. It's, it's across the board. I, I, I have a hard time finding people that don't say that that happens. Yeah, that that happens. With, yeah with, with wow. the ketogenic diet and improved micronutrient intake and, and all that good stuff. So, so yeah, it's, it's normalized. Um, and that worries me because brain fog, recurrent and chronic brain fog does not get better on its own without some kind of change, you know, and yes, we're going to go through life and There'll be days maybe where we wake up with some brain fog and we're like, I don't know what's going on. And, you know, maybe we got exposed to a cootie and our, we've got some neuroinflammation going on, right, as a result. Or, you know, maybe we ate something that didn't agree with us and that that's causing a little bit. And, and I get that. I'm not pathologizing that at all. Like, that's just, and especially in this, kind, this world with a lot of different toxins and a lot of different cabillion things to be exposed to that our body probably doesn't want to deal with. But if it's recurrent and chronic. And by recurrent, I think like if half of your week you feel like a zombie, that's recurrent. If maybe you have a week of clear thinking, but you know the next week or for two weeks you're going to have brain fog, that's a problem. If you're a woman and you have a cycle and, and your brain just stops working about two weeks before, before your period, that's a problem. And it's not just hormonal, although hormonal can be a part of it. Right. And and so that's the stuff I just don't want to see people living with acting like it's OK or that they have to lower the bar on their life because of that when it's so treatable um, and people can learn how to treat it. Um, and and they deserve some better some better options than are out there. Wow. OK, so pure speculation. There's no way I would assume there's no way to absolutely like know this. But in your experience, in your speculation, what percentage of our population did you just just describe having at least one of those things? I feel like it's 80. Yeah. <laughs> that's the number that went in my head. That's what I was that thinking. Question. It's yeah. like, that's like pretty much everyone. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Wow, that's crazy. Okay, so we're going to park that for a minute. I, I definitely want to take a deep dive into that today and some of the things that we can do about it. But like I said, I want to go back to your story. I find it really interesting. I don't know if ironic is the right word that you chose to get into mental health and you ended up dealing with some mental health issues yourself. So can you talk about what it was like to, um, you know, learn so many amazing things in the mental health space, but also have to deal with it yourself? Yeah, well, um, I... I didn't identify as anxious at all, really. Um, I went into psychology because I was really interested in relationships. Um, and I had just had my second daughter and I looked around and all my books were about relationships and parenting and attachment and all that. So that's kind of what I went into psychology for. And then when I uh, was in my first semester of graduate school, I developed some kind of chronic pain thing going on in my face and my neck, and it caused daily migraines. It was actually trigeminal neuralgia, which um, is is pretty a pretty bad one, pretty painful. Um, daily to, migraines? Daily, daily migraines. I would start up Brutal. okay in the morning, but then as the day progressed, I would get a debilitating migraine and it was awful. And I would get shooting pain and, you know, nerve pain, the, a, a breeze would hit my face. It was, it was really difficult. And especially with young children, um, wanting to, you know, wanting to go to the park, my husband really overcompensated for me during that time. I missed a lot of quality opportunities with my kiddos because wow. of that. Um, but so I did all the things the doctors told me, uh, got 
got told got told that really the only way to fix it or to get relief because there isn't a lot of treatments for trigeminal neuralgia and chronic daily migraine as people know um was to get on pain medications did it didn't want to and i was one of those special folks that just could not get off um and on a physiological level like it wasn't i wasn't psychologically ready to get the heck off of those because they just completely they just completely wreck your quality of life um long term at least in the moment they're very helpful but they they stop working very well you constantly have to go up on dosage they're huge hormone disruptors in the body they are huge micronutrient depleters um and so finally i got off of them and uh but it was after like 14 years i was going through this for like 14 years um, Crazy. and and I, they had me on a bridge medication that I could not get off of that I was told is much, it's more difficult to get people physiologically off of than heroin, much worse. Um, finally found a guy who was doing an experimental protocol that I paid out of pocket for, um, and, and I made it through it. It was awful, that protocol, um, felt terrible, was sure I was dying as I was going through it. Like every cell in my body was like, this is it. But I got through it, but my brain was wrecked, absolutely wrecked afterwards. Um, I could not find words. Whatever thought I had came out of my mouth immediately. I had no frontal lobe control, um, oh, no. which I guess was kind of fun, you know, on, on <laughs> some level. I guess I'm going to look back on it. Um, I, I, I was... I couldn't remember some faces that I had already met. I started to lose the ability for faces. Um, I would need to run, you know, copay credit card numbers, and I couldn't hold more than one or two numbers at a time in wow. my head long enough to punch it into the credit card machine. It was bad. It was it was at least a stage one Alzheimer's type of impairment that was going on, and that is from being on those types of drugs. And plus, you know, the gabapentin and all the other stuff that they add to those cocktails for chronic pain. So, you know, being on that for 14 years and then going through this really awful protocol that just is scrubbing your opioid receptors. That's what the doctor said. I don't even know if that's a thing, but, you know, I, I just I couldn't even walk for a month after that detox. I had I had to have help going to the bathroom. My oldest daughter had to make my food for me when my husband was gone. I was in bad shape. I thought I was going to have to like close my practice, you know, but I slowly got a little bit better, but my brain did not come back all the way, the way I wanted it to. Um, I, I had stopped reading because I couldn't read. I couldn't, it was very cognitively taxing. I would get that thing uh, that we talked about just before we started recording where um, you do a cognitive task and if, if it makes you more tired, if it makes your brain fog worse after doing the task, then that is a sign of how bad your neurodegeneration is. Because it's just like when you, you know, let's say you've been sedentary for a long time and you don't have a lot of muscle strength and you're like, I'm going to go to the gym and I'm going to work out really hard and you work out really hard. And then you're kind of in bad shape for four days. You're in terrible pain. You're fatigued. You're, you didn't get the energy from it you expected. It's too much for your body. That's what that's what really, really bad brain fog is. They, you know, they can't just push through a passage on a, in a book or whatever. So I uh, I came across I could still listen <laughs> and I was still a curious human, even though I couldn't retain anything very well. And I was listening to podcasts and uh, one about the ketogenic diet popped up and they were talking about how it was beginning to be used with Alzheimer's and dementias. And people were talking about how it was used for performance and mental clarity and all that. And I was like, oh, that sounds like what I need. I need some of that. So after watching or not watching, but listening to probably, I feel like it was 50 podcasts because I literally needed that much repetition to get it in my brain well enough to actually do it. That's how bad I was. Um, I did it. And it, there was some stops and starts and some figuring things out because a lot of the information on ketogenic diets are not for, for brain fog and cognitive. A lot of it is about weight loss, which does not always work for people who are just trying to, uh, who are trying to fix their brain. Like they need a different level of keto sometimes. So that's what I needed. 
and then my brain just kind of woke up and it was like four days into a very, very strict ketogenic diet. And I was like, Oh, things are turning on in here. Like I have some energy. And then three months later, I'm joining a gym because once your mental energy improves, your physical energy improves. So yeah. But when I did that, I noticed that after, you know, a few days, I'm like, Oh, I feel really chill. I guess I was kind of anxious before and I didn't even realize it. Yeah. Wow. That is such an interesting story. Thank you so much for sharing that. I'm curious. I know it's probably been a, a minute at this point. Do you remember who you were listening to that first podcast? Do you know whose work you came across? I think it was Dom. Hmm. Dom Diagostino. Yeah. I Diagostino, remember cool. some stuff from him. Um, Will Cole was on, he's a, he's a functional medicine person. He was talking on a particular podcast. I don't remember what it was now, but he was talking a lot about ketogenic diets. Yeah. Um, and you know, eventually I moved on to Georgia, uh, finding the, her stuff and, and all that. So yeah, it was just kind of a process of, well, you know how it is once you start one and you're like, I want to know more information and you're oh, like yeah. grabbing all the podcasts. Yeah. This is yeah, my whole life for seven, eight years, like every, the things I do for fun, the things I listen to, like in my car, the books I read, like every, my entire life is around this area. And it, mm-hmm. it really does grab you. It's kind of interesting. And I always love asking people, you know, who were the, the first people? I think of it as like, who's your like Mount Rushmore, the three or four people, you know, heads yeah. you have <laughs> carved in the mountain. So yeah. interesting. So we've learned a lot about ketogenic health with some of the really major nasty mental diseases. Maybe we can just spend a minute talking about, you know, those. So we talked dementia, Alzheimer's, schizophrenia, all these things that have diagnoses that are very severe. People, again, like you said before, you you, you have this, you're, you're probably going to die from this. There's no way to reverse it. As far as the big major ones that people, you know, are, are more scared of, I guess, what are some of the things we've learned about ketogenic diets improving those? Yeah, so there's all kinds of great research going on, Um, amazing research, Uh, and and there's stuff going on for bipolar disorder, schizophrenia. I mean, I work with bipolar in my private practice, uh, mostly individually right now, and so I just see people improve all the time with that. So with bipolar disorder, they tend to have ways to alleviate the manic symptoms, but, but the ways that they help the depressive symptoms and, and bipolar depression is, I, I am not bipolar and I, I've never experienced one of their depressions, but I, I think it is from what I hear and what is described to me, I think it is one of the worst things ever. And so these, these, these bipolar patients are, you know, their, their mania is better um, and pretty well, pretty well controlled, but, but they're always the scary sensation that they're about to fall in that pit. And it is really hard to get out. And the medications that they have for that just do not suffice and are not doing the trick. Yeah. And what I am seeing and what I'm hearing with other metabolic psychiatry pr- practitioners is that this is that missing piece for, for, for them. That it really, for most of them, um, and I'm sure, you know, like Chris Palmer probably works with a lot more, you know, people with very severe bipolar. I'm a private practice person, a small practice, you know, I get a lot of people in, but, you know, I don't get the worst of the worst for sure. I'm not at Harvard, you know, people go to the big medical centers. So I'm sure there's people where it has not worked for them, but for everyone I've worked with thus far, um, it's just life-changing. Yeah, no, that's so interesting. I I worked with somebody who had bipolar. I can't remember. I know there's different like classifications. I can't remember exactly which one. But and, and unfortunately, you know, she was getting her nutrition information from a registered dietitian. So there wasn't much I could do besides kind of sneak a few ketogenic things in there. But by mm-hmm. and large, the dietitian was not interested in learning about any of that. Wasn't having any of that. And I, I do recall. I, I recall like you spend most of your good days just dreading the bad days. Like, like it, yeah. it's not like I'm enjoying feeling good. It's like, this is my relief and I'm almost like storing up my energy for the next bad thing. And, and it, it seemed very severe. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, it's not a great quality of life. Um, and, and we can do better and we have to just make this accessible. 
Yeah. Has there been, since we talked last, has there been any kind of major improvements with the medications that we give these people? Not that I am aware of. I am not a prescriber, so I don't keep up with all the medications. Um, other than I work with people who go on ketogenic diets that end up often having to be deprescribed and titrated down off their medications. That's really the most I know about those medications. Um, but they are, and they are mostly anti-seizure uh, medications for some of them. It's about trying to stabilize that mood. And I, I think ketogenic diets being a metabolic psychiatry intervention is actually much better at that and provides much more systemic benefit in a lot of different areas, areas like a pleiotropic type of intervention than the medications. Yeah, totally. I totally agree from what I've seen out there. And even just recently, I don't know if you can comment on this, but uh, with Alzheimer's research, focusing on amyloid plaques in the brain, it turns out that was all like a scam, basically. Mm -hmm. Well, in anybody who, uh, like, I've, I've kind of known that was a scam for a long time. Anybody who has been paying attention <laughs> in any way, shape, or form, uh, knew that that just wasn't holding water, that those uh, those drug trials were not doing well, that they would have to take people out of the drug trials because people would uh, start to get worse. And uh, anybody who has an Alzheimer's patient at home, quite frankly, knows those drugs don't do jack and are, or at, at the least, are very insufficient. And um, and, and you can go on like a Reddit Alzheimer, you know, um, subreddit, they're called, go on a subreddit and be like, hey, did, did that medication help your dad or your mom or whatever? And they will go off. They are mad. They are frustrated and sad. Um, so any, anybody who's been paying attention at all knows that those drugs that were focusing on amyloid plaques were not the answer. And anybody who's been interested in you know, the science around it um, had, knew there was alternative theories that those were just the firemen. That was just the spackle trying to, to shore up the brain after the damage has already occurred. And anybody who's read Bredesen's protocol, for example, knows that the injury is happening way before the plaques come along. And mm. yeah, is there an overdrive of plaques? Sure. But there's a lot of injury going on in the brain that it's trying to shore up. And so it's all kind of connected, but yeah, that was not a big surprise to me, but I'm super excited that it came out because maybe we can stop this nonsense and actually kind of focus on something that is helpful. Yeah, I would certainly hope that to be the case. I'm not super optimistic that that will be the case, but I, I certainly hope so. And you mentioned the anger, these people getting angry. And you, I mean, you're right. Why wouldn't they be furious? It, it, for as much as the person going through it is suffering, you just you hear consistently all the people around that person that then have to take care of the person. They're watching people that they loved just kind of slip away. It's yeah. terrible. It's absolutely horrifying. No wonder they're pissed. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And in those in those forums, they they have no idea that there is a nutritional intervention that improves symptoms so well for for early stage and moderate stage Alzheimer's. They they have wow. no idea that it's even an option because it's never presented to them. Wow. And I think that's really unfair. That's so sad. I've heard you talk about just having consent, having 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 this message told to you so you can decide what to do is so yeah. important. And people don't get that chance. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. So we go back to something you just said, and you, you said that the injury is starting far sooner than, than we see these plaques show up. And so now I want to talk about not so much those big, scary ones that we hear about all the time, but now kind of more of the run of the mill stuff. So, you know, the brain fog that we mentioned, mm -hmm. um, the, you know, the, the depression, the anxiety, yeah. which I would assume is far, far undiagnosed for many, many people, even though it's, you know, like the biggest cause of us missing work these days. Yeah. And I would even go down to like the stories I hear from my clients about what is going on in middle schools and, and like how that health is deteriorating is absolutely crazy and astounding to me. One of my clients is sending their girl to a different public school because the one they were going to go to, she said the suicide rate is off the charts. 
in in high school and middle school like it's it's really sad and so i want to kind of focus our discussion now on the things that have been normalized you know again around the brain fog around all these things that people are experiencing and maybe not taking so seriously and hopefully people can walk away from this thinking that yeah you should take this stuff seriously right now yeah yeah and and those you know those kids often are aware of that they're having symptoms they they will self-diagnose uh to the best of their ability they will say i'm depressed they will say i have an anxiety disorder they will uh, say i have adhd i can't focus um and they will they will zero in on this idea that they have something going on that can't be cured because that's what's all over google right um or that they have to take medication or that something you know something's really wrong with them in such a way that it can't be fixed they're defective in some way um, and there is a complete lack of looking at like i work with i work with some older teenagers and some some young adults you know in their 20s you know 18 to probably 24 and i will i will get them on my zoom because i do telehealth and we will zoom and I will slowly ask them about their diet and their nutrition. And when they tell me about their diet and their nutrition, I am always slightly horrified because they're not getting enough protein. They don't even have enough protein, I think, to make their serotonin, to make their, their neurotransmitters. Um, they are eating, nutrient depleting diet. So I, I know that they do not have enough magnesium. I know that they are seriously depleted in thiamine because thiamine is used for high carbohydrate diets and you can deplete yourself. And then once you're depleted in thiamine, you can't make certain enzymes. You start getting gut motility issues. You start getting, you know, all the digestive stuff that we say, oh, that's depression. Well, you know what? It's also thiamine insufficiency from a very high carbohydrate diet. Of, of highly processed carbohydrates, right? Um, and, and so there's there's all these different connections. And I'm like, hey, let's put you on a whey protein shake once a day. Can we get you having a, a chocolate whey protein shake or whatever? I don't care. Vanilla, you should surprise me, right? Just have a just have have some amino acids so that you can make your neurotransmitters. And I had this one client with o who had a diagnosis of OCD. ADHD, autism spectrum, all these diagnoses. And I would literally see them deteriorate based on whether or not they had that way shake regularly. I'd be like, hey, so-and-so, you're pretty sad today. Your OCD is a little off the charts. When was the last time you had your way shake? And they'd be like, oh, it's been like two weeks. Okay, well, let's get that going again. Wow. And then you know, a week after that, they're like, hey, I'm, I'm doing pretty good. I'm not like ruminating. And, and I'm, and it, it's just, it's that simple. And these kids, they're eating plant, pro, plant-based proteins, tiny amounts of proteins, only half of it is bioavailable. So they eat a little bar that says 10 grams of protein. They're really only absorbing maybe five. Oh yeah. You know, they're just not, they're not getting it. And then a complete, you know, then of course the, the nutrients that the nutrients that are in all the highly processed foods, a lot of them are not bioavailable. A lot of them can cause their own problems. Like these, there's just, they just don't have the basic things they need for their brain to work. And then they are understandably upset that they're not feeling well. And they, and there's no connection between that. Um, yeah. That's crazy. Doctors aren't checking their vitamin D levels, right? You need vitamin D in order to make to do a lot of stuff to, to calm that immune system. Like these kids, these kids, quite frankly, have neurodegenerative processes starting up at a very early age because we are just dropping the ball on the the basic nutrition piece. The basic this is your body's manual. This is the stuff you want your body to work. You want your brain to work. You want your mood to work you want to sleep this is the basic stuff that it needs in these ways so i just i just kills me to see people take on all these diagnoses i don't you know i get these teenagers are like i think i have adhd i want you to evaluate me for adhd and i say 
I can't possibly evaluate you for ADHD because you're not giving yourself your brain what it needs to work. I don't know if your brain works like an ADHD brain because you're not actually giving yourself the basic things your brain needs to function. So let's put you on a broad spectrum micronutrient. Let's put you on an amino acid supplementation and let's do that for a month. And then we'll talk about me evaluating you for ADHD. Wow. It sounds like trying to determine whether a car works without having any oil or gasoline. Like you would never know. Yeah. You would never know. And I don't see the point of evaluating them for ADHD when they don't have that basic stuff. And I know that the stimulant medications that they're going to get from their prescriber are nutrient depleting and are famously so, and will eventually compound the problem because their brain will have less and less micronutrients to do basic things that it needs to do, like make neurotransmitters and reduce oxidative stress and fight neuroinflammation. And that is why when you get humans who have been on stimulants for a long time for ADHD, there is a certain point where it just doesn't work well anymore for them. No matter how high they go, it just doesn't seem to fix their ADHD symptoms. And then they walk around thinking that ADHD is like their personality and their base level of functioning um, and that they just can't function and it's because of their ADHD, right? Well, the meds aren't working anymore. Well, there's a reason the meds are not working anymore you're depleted and you didn't have what you needed to make your brain work well in the first place. And that's not even getting into the pieces about areas of brain hypometabolism and the neurotransmitter imbalances that happen when we, uh, when we, we don't have a good diet. That is terrifying. I remember just being blown away when I first heard about that with those medications. That that is absolutely terrifying. And again, we think of these issues as completely pervasive. It's 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 normal. It's normalized that these kids can't pay attention in school and need to take some type of medication to know that that is in their future. It is absolutely terrifying. Wow. So okay. So with brain fog itself, how how, how do you define brain fog? I define, uh, well, I define brain fog as, you know, it's such a subjective thing. Uh, it, 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 it's where you just, you feel fuzzy. Your brain feels fuzzy. You can't concentrate very well necessarily. It's very difficult to get into something like you and I, if we have an interest, we're just going to like eat it up, right? We're going to just follow where we have the mental energy to zero in on something and just take it as far as you know we want to go with it uh maybe several hours or days or weeks right <laughs> depending on what's going on but this is so it's it's a lack of mental energy it's a lack of mental focus it's a inability to retrieve information everybody's brain fog is different it's hard to give a definition and i'll tell you why because people's individual brain fog symptoms reflect the area of the brain in which a neurodegenerative process is happening. So let me give you an example. I have one client, um, and this is well known, but I have one client who, when he, when he gets brain fog, he feels like he can't form his words. It's not that he can't retrieve his words, that's a different part of the brain. He doesn't have a problem there but he'll start to feel, in his mind, he feels like he's slurring his words. He's having the experience of the musculature not cooperating with what he's trying to say. That's the frontal lobe, that's Broca's area of the brain. He's got a neurodegenerative process going on in that particular area, right? There's other areas of the brain. I have a great blog post about that. Where is that? I can't remember the name, I didn't remember what I titled it. But uh, it's probably brain fog. If you go to mentalhealthketo.com and you um, put brain fog in at the search bar at the end of the page, you'll come up with it. Um, it's got a big old picture of a brain. You can't miss it. But it talks about how what brain fog symptoms are linked to neurodegenerative processes in what brain structures. And so that's what makes it very difficult is that um, everybody, every, you know, different structures of the brain for different people. Are, have different, you know, levels of susceptibility. And so, yeah, it depends. Brain fog is different for everybody, but it's always something that needs to be paid attention to when it doesn't go away right away and stay away. Interesting. For the listener, listen to Nicole. Like if you're driving, pull over. 
pull over for a second and bookmark your website, which is absolutely fantastic. You have such a great wealth of information there. I love your blog. It's fantastic. Um, okay, so brain fog has lots of different ways it can manifest. That makes sense. Um, and this is not like a diagnosis. You're not given this as a diagnosis. It's just a generalized thing that you feel. If it were you, would you diagnose this with people? I wouldn't because it is a symptom of something else going on in the body. Like you can have brain fog, you can have brain fog um, because you have an autoimmune issue. You can have brain fog going on because of a hormonal issue. You can have brain fog going on because you've had a traumatic brain injury, whether you've bonked your head or you, you know, I've had people have a, med I think I had a traumatic brain injury from the medications for sure. <laughs> like, you know, it doesn't have to be a hit in the head, but I mean, it, it can be from a lot of different different pieces. Um, and so it's really a symptom of something else going on. Now that said, and, and I, I, I see this a lot and I have to talk to people about this a lot. I will, you know, because I am trying to get the word out that brain fog, regardless of reason or diagnosis is highly treatable and that people can learn how to treat their own brain fog, regardless of reason or diagnosis you get a lot of people who are like, oh, my brain fog is because of my chronic fatigue syndrome. My brain fog is from fibromyalgia. My brain fog is from Hashimoto's. My brain fog is from, you know, you name it. My, I'm perimenopausal or postmenopausal. My brain fog is definitely from the hormones, right? Your brain fog is from mitochondrial dysfunction. And the interventions that is, are used to help treat brain fog are fantastic for every single one of those conditions, any type of autoimmune issue. Um, and even if you have a pre-existing condition that you um, have been told contributes to your brain fog and probably does contribute to your brain fog, that does not mean you have to live with those symptoms. Wow. Wow. Okay. So we're talking about metabolic dysfunction in the brain. What, what things specifically are causing that in your opinion, especially when it comes to diet? Yeah. So when I look at yeah, when it comes to diet, you know, it depends. I mean, I've got, there's people with brain fog that are actually eating a good whole foods diet. They're eating the sweet potato. They're eating the, um, they're having some, they're having animal products for, for, you know, meat and for protein. They're having bioavailable things. Um, but there's stuff that goes on that still potentially needs to be addressed. So it's not just the people who are eating terrible food. There's, it's also happening for people who are eating what we would consider a paleo or a whole foods diet that, that you know, poor things, they feel like they're doing everything right. They're going to the functional medicine person, they're getting the ashwagandha, the herbs, you know, they're, they're really trying. Um, they're really trying. And, but there's some basic things that have to be done. I think to really go after brain fog in a hard way and clear it up. Um, and one of the major things that happens in, in the brains of people with brain fog that, that we don't talk about, or that is just not getting enough attention is brain hypometabolism. So hypo means low metabolism means energy, low energy. There's parts of their brain probably the structures that they have neurodegenerative processes in, <laughs> right? That correlate to what their brain fog symptoms are that are not using glucose for energy well, because the machinery, uh, the machinery gets broken over time with a high, really high carbohydrate diet. And there can be other things going on that might be making a brain structure hypometabolic. Like maybe they just are, don't have enough micronutrients, even though they're eating that great diet, you know, maybe they've got, you know, two copies of MTHFR and they're not getting their B vitamins in a bioavailable form so they can make their neurotransmitters, right? I mean, that could cause an energy crisis in the brain, right? It's not just all about glucose. So they have parts of the brain we've got to wake up. And I don't care why they're tired and not working, but they got to be woken up. They've got to get an energy source. And the best energy source for a brain that is struggling with hypometabolism are ketones, good old BHB. And so that is always the first part. That is part one of treating brain fog. If you are serious about getting rid of it, 
and you are serious about getting your life back and you were serious about not having brain fog, decide what activities you're going to do the rest of your life because it makes you too tired, then you do a ketogenic diet. Wow. Wow. Okay. You mentioned sweet potatoes. I'm just curious. Do, do you, do you suspect that oxalate might be part of people eating the quote unquote healthy diet, but suffering from symptoms of brain fog? You know, I don't know. I haven't, um, you know, I do have people that we've done a ketogenic diet and, you know, we don't do a lot of sweet potatoes in a ketogenic diet <laughs> or at all. But they, you know, they'll eat a lot of cocoa or whatever, you know, they'll eat all the other, there's plenty of high oxalate foods in a ketogenic diet for sure. Um, and they don't get quite the results they want and they will go carnivore for a while and then they will get their results. I have mm. one guy that I work with um, and he, he would did ketogenic diet and he was doing it well. And he's like, I, I, my intuition is telling me to go carnivore and he did, and he's been carnivore since, and he's doing beautifully. Wow. Um, interesting. And so I'm not against going off the oxalates. I don't know how much, I wish there was a good, you know, a good way to tell. It's such a, oxalates are mysterious. Like They're we could do mysterious. a whole episode on those. Yeah. Sally. Yeah. I got, we got, you got, you had Sally. So did yeah, you have Sally on too. here? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Twice. Yeah. And every yeah. time we learn something new and it, it's, it's, and Monique Ashinger, we just hosted as well. And you, you're learning about this and you're just like, okay, this is, this is either, very mysterious or this is a monster problem mm -hmm. Mon it's, monster. It's, it's hard to tell <laughs> probably a monster well that's saying something though if, if the oxalates are a huge issue and they go in your brain and they're causing all these problems the fact that you can go on a ketogenic diet and in probably 90 percent of the cases get a huge improvement that's yeah. beautiful yeah yeah yeah, that's awesome. Okay, so back to um, ketones. For somebody who was maybe not as familiar, what is so magical about a ketone? Oh my gosh, ketones yes. are magical. <laughs> they are. I don't mean to sound like a weirdo, but it's true. So ketones, so there's there's different kinds of ketones. There's three. And, um, you know, they do different things. For sure. One of them is BHB. BHB stands for beta hydroxybutyrate. And beta hydroxybutyrate is a signaling mole molecule. Like it will literally turn genes off and on. And it in a good way, apparently, in a really beneficial way. So it it really just absolutely uh, improves inflammation and body inflammation. And when you reduce body inflammation, you automatically reduce neuroinflammation, right? You can't have arthritis in your knee and not have neuroinflammation. People don't understand that because when the immune system gets fired up, you know, and there's, there's irritation in the body that fires up what's going on in the brain as well. They talk to each other. Um, and so, so, so they, they completely plummet inflammation, which is fantastic for plummeting neuroinflammation. Um, they upregulate your natural endogenous antioxidant system of glutathione. Uh, ketones will help your body make more glutathione to clean up the hot mess that's going on of oxidative stress in your brain and help your brain actually heal um, and stop neurodegenerative processes. It has a fantastic effect on the immune system my gosh, ketogenic diets, um, we're talking about ketones, but ketogenic diets improve the gut microbiome in a favorable way uh, in just a few days, but really, really hardcore after about 14 days. Um, those tight junctions in your body that need to be tight, love ketones and use them for a fuel for repair. So if you've got leaky gut, you've got leaky, leaky brain barrier they correlate like 90%. Wow. So, uh, and you need nice tight junctions in your blood brain barrier so that, you know, stuff doesn't float up there that your brain then has to freak out about and make a bunch of inflammatory cytokines to protect you against and causing, you know, destruction as it goes. It's like those police car chases, right? Where they go flying through the, <laughs> through the bad guy and buildings are falling behind them. That yep. is, that is inflammatory cytokines, um, in the brain. So, what, do, what don't those little ketone things do? I don't know. It's so amazing. They're, yeah, they're a fuel. The, the main <laughs> thing, so they do all those things. Oh, they upregulate um, uh, BDN, BDN, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. 
um, which is super helpful and important when you are trying to heal your brain, right? I mean, they do so many things. I have to actually pull up something to, to tell you all the things that ketones do. But when it comes to brain hypometabolism, what they do that's very, very helpful is they go right into the brain cell and are burned as fuel. They bypass any broken machinery. They don't need any special transporters. And this is another thing ketones do. They help upregulate the production of cell batteries called mitochondria. So when you do ketogenic, you know, I always say step one is change your brain fuel. Well, I'm really minimizing the effects of what a ketogenic diet is when I say that, because I'm just trying, I mean, I think that's a big, important part. If I can't get those ketones in there, they're not going to do all the other cool stuff that they need to do, but they are fantastic brain fuel and they will help you make more cell batteries for more energy and make these cell batteries that you have work more efficiently. And so I just can't heal your brain for you until you do a ketogenic diet because it takes so much energy in the brain for the brain to function well. And until you fix that broken machinery somehow over time, I just want to, I just want to get your brain fuel up so you wow. can feel better. That's amazing. Yeah. I love talking about the benefits of ketones themselves. There's so many wonderful things we're learning all the time that mm -hmm. they're doing. And to think too, this is our natural state. This isn't a fad diet that you read about in the oh. grocery store magazine. This is our natural normal state that we should always be in, that we have always been in throughout our evolution. Being able to fast when we don't have food, being able to survive when we didn't have things growing spontaneously all the time for us to be eating. It's an absolute treat when we come across those things and we should enjoy those. But in, in, in that world, we had to be able to be in that state and to go very long times without food. And here we are. Like, that's what we do. That's what we're great at as humans. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's crazy. Okay. So step one was increasing the ketones. And, and you and I talked about last time, we talked about Dr. Mary Newport, who was able to help her husband before he passed away with his Alzheimer's. And I recall, I don't even think they used a ketogenic diet, and, and especially, I guess, in the 30 days that they did those clock tests, they just started throwing, um, they started coconut throwing, oil. I believe it was coconut oil in yeah. his oatmeal. Yeah. And didn't make any other changes. And so when we're starting at step one, or is that the thing we just want to get the ketones? tones up as high as possible? And if so, what are some ways that we can do that? Yeah. So when, uh, when we do that, so with my people in my brain fog recovery program and with my, with my individual clients, although I'm taking much less individual clients, um, or at all, really, I mostly, if you want to work with me, you're going to have to just sign up for my program because I'm just not seeing, <laughs> right. I'm moving away from individual work. And a part of that is because one, when you do this, you say a lot of the same things over and over, you know, that with your clients. Um, and two, I just want to help more people. I want to, I want to be able to have lots and lots of people. And when I am, when I am tethered to one person per hour a day, I can't have the effect on the world that I want to have. So if anyone's listening to this and you want to work with me, you're going to have to sign up for my pro program. Don't even ask me for individual because sometimes <laughs> I feel a little pressured and I'll say yes <laughs> when I shouldn't. Um, yeah, so we, we do use MCT oil and we do use uh, BHB salts a little bit in my program. Uh, they are optional. I find that they can be useful the first couple of weeks that people are transitioning because again, people are at different levels of neurodegenerative processes. They come to my program in differing levels of that, right? And so, um, so sometimes that really helps them just feel that brain energy. But I always tell them, do not reach for the MCT oil and the ketone salts until you have done your electrolytes, because that's what they'll always think. They'll be like, oh, I don't have enough brain energy. I need this MCT oil, bulletproof coffee, or this BHB drink. And they will forget to, they'll think that that's it when really it's the electrolytes. So mm -hmm. there's that big caveat of don't do one first, right? You know, or do one first. Don't immediately think you need this fancy, expensive drink when really you just need a half a teaspoon of Redmond sea salt over the next hour. Yeah, that's very interesting. So a few weeks ago, my coffee maker broke um, and I oh, found I'm sorry. that I, I know, I know it was tragic. <laughs> I, I did fine. I was okay with it. And I, I found that I don't think I missed the caffeine as much as I missed. I, I do a bulletproof kind of style 
coffee in the morning where I use a little bit of MCT, just a little bit of butter. And I also am adding Redmond salt to the mix and I blend yeah. it all up. I was missing that effect way more than I feel like I was missing the caffeine. The caffeine will wake me up in a really jittery way. But mm -hmm. I, I described like the, the MCT oil hitting my brain. It, it's like the lights just go on and I'm just level. I'm, I'm ready. I'm I'm still calm. I'm not jittery, but, but yeah. I'm just like activated and alert and aware. And it helps me just feel like I can be in that state for a very long time. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Good stuff. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So other steps in your program that you want to highlight, um, you know, besides getting the ketones up as high as we can get them, which I think is, is really great. What other things do you promote? Yeah. So the, the second step of the brain fog recovery program is personalized micronutrient intake. So when people start my program, I always put them on some, some supplements, some basic supplements that are beyond electrolytes. Um, but you know, extra magnesium for sure, but there's also some B vitamins and some trace minerals and some stuff that we add automatically. And we do that because we're trying to heal brains and it really takes a lot of those those cofactors in order to, to help things. And then, you know, so after we get them level on their ketogenic diet, we start focusing on personalized micronutrient intake. And the way we do that, that's kind of cool is we have them get their 23 and me or their ancestry DNA, or if they're nervous about, you know, them having their information, they can get their report from a provider, but we look at some genetic SNPs. Like we're going to, we're going to check and see if you need specific types of B vitamins, because there's a lot of people who do, um, they're, they've got those genetic SNPs and they just cannot make the bioactive form of the different B vitamins that they need, B12 and folate. And then that connects to all the other Bs. Um, we're going to look and see if they actually can convert beta carotene into vitamin A. There's lots of people trying to get their vitamin A from carrots and sweet potatoes. Right that cannot convert it into a bioactive form of vitamin A. That's right. Um, and vitamin A is really important for immune function and you have to have healthy immune function to have a healthy brain, right? Um, we're gonna look at their D SNPs. We're gonna look at um, their SNPs for zinc. Um, their SNPs for, oh my gosh, choline is a huge one. Like I cannot tell you uh, how many people's brain finally lights up the rest of the way with some, some choline supplements. So there's a lot of people who have SNPs that make it so that they can't produce enough choline that they need. They would have to eat eight eggs a day. And I don't care how many eggs, how much you like eggs, you're gonna get tired of eating eight eggs a day. I'm not even sure you should, I don't know. <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know what happens. But ironically, most... ironically, that's exactly the number of eggs I ate like a few hours ago. Perfect. Yeah. No, I've done it myself too, but I just wouldn't <laughs> want to do it every day necessarily, right. you know, variety. So, uh, so, so their brain is not getting what it needs in order to uh, make healthy membranes, make healthy connections, all that kind of stuff. There's people who are relying on uh, vegetarian sources uh, in order to get their omegas that cannot convert them. Right, they, they they cannot convert that ALA to to what they need to convert it for a healthy brain function. So we have to look at these SNPs with people. Um, when I healed my brain, I got really really far on a ketogenic diet, really really far in in cool ways. And then there was just, I, you know, you know how it is well, once your brain is better, you want to learn things too. So I just kept looking and kept looking and kept looking. And I am one of those people who need choline and I need a specific form of it. And once I added that, holy crap, my brain was on all the way. So wow. if you have residual symptoms of brain fog, like, here's the thing, there's people who join my program that are like, I've done a ketogenic diet and it didn't help. And we talk about it and it turns out they did a ketogenic diet that was designed for weight loss that really focused on kind of net carbs and, and, and it, they didn't get their carbohydrates down in a way that their body understood, right? Because your gut microbiome can take some fiber here and there and do things with it, right? So they just didn't have a stable level of ketone. So we do a, we do a ketogenic diet for mental illness and neurological disorders. And that is 20, 20, maybe 30 total grams of carbs. Like we don't mess around. 
because we really want that person to become fat adapted quickly and be able to burn their own body fat for ketones. And then we want to add some ketones because we want to give that brain all the fuel it needs that it wants in order to heal. And then you add this piece and really beautiful things happen um, because a lot of people are going into their ketogenic diets already hugely nutrient de depleted from their past diets. So they're like, I did a ketogenic diet, it didn't help. Well, you were already thiamine depleted. You were already magnesium depleted. The magnesium levels that you were taking when you started your ketogenic diet is still, we're not sufficient, you know, popping a, we're not talking about popping a 400 milligram or 200 milligrams a day, right? We're talking about 400 to 800, right? To, to fix a, fix a depletion. Um, you know, it, they're coming into the diet already depleted. So this second stage is really important because we are literally giving the body everything it needs to heal that brain. And remember, we talked about how ketones upregulate glutathione. Well, glutathione needs particular micronutrients and lots of amino acids, some in particular that are rate limiting. If you don't have enough of this particular amino acid, you're not, right? So, so you know, if, if we, we add those so that their body can make as much glutathione as it wants in order to heal and fix things. So we do nutrigenomics in the second piece and we make sure we add all of those great micronutrients that the body uses to upregulate and make tons of glutathione. And that really helps brain fog. Wow. So critical. That's amazing. Any other steps in the process? Yes. The very last step is functional nutrition coaching or functional medicine coaching, basically. Um, and that's where, you know, if I've got someone who's been doing all the things, step one and step two for a good three to six months, and they have not exponentially gotten better, then we've got to do some sleuthing. We've got to figure out if they have some heavy metal burden going on that's getting in the way of their brain function. We have to figure out if they've got some untreated Lyme disease or an untreated infection or parasite going on. We've got to figure out if they have been exposed to mycotoxins. We've just got to figure out what the last piece is. Um, because quite frankly, the ketogenic diet cleans up things, so many things, so many issues ahead of time that it makes functional medicine so much easier to do. I mean, think about it. I mean, quite frankly, I don't want to do functional health coaching with someone who is not on a ketogenic diet because you going at, it's like playing whack-a-mole, right? I'm not sure functional medicine is legit if it hasn't addressed the huge physiological stressor of high blood sugars in, in people. Like if someone is not insulin sensitive enough to handle a sweet potato, why are we telling them to eat sweet potatoes? Why not, like, we're not paying attention to that as a huge stressor. Yeah. And there's so many chronic <laughs> illnesses that are connected to insulin resistance that it just seems stupid not to clean that up first before you go after any underlying causes or primary yeah, causes. Yeah, start with the very biggest thing. Mitochondrial disease. Like when you look at one of those, those memes that talk about functional medicine and it's a tree and there's up there in the branches, right? At the roots, they're supposed to be addressing mitochondrial function. And there is no other intervention that affects mitochondrial function the way ketogenic diets do. I suppose you could give someone a cabillion supplements, which a lot of functional medicine practitioners do, trying to access those same pathways that upregulate mitochondrial function. But why not just go, why not just go for it, right? Why not just go, why not just do the intervention that we know upregulates mitochondrial function? Let's let that clean up what it can clean up. Let's see what that does. Let's give the body all the micronutrients it could possibly want need. Let's let the wisdom of the body do its thing, which is what functional medicine is supposed to help with, and then try to go after some leftover things that are getting in the way, like a parasite, you know, causing yeah. a bunch of inflammation in the body, which is causing a bunch of inflammation in the brain or yeah. hormone imbalance. Let's let the ketogenic diet, along with those micronutrients, 
along with that improved sensitivity to thyroid and sex hormones that happens on a ketogenic diet. Let's have that do its thing in perimenopause, right? Before we start whipping out the, the bioidentical hormones for these people, because that's not necessarily a root cause intervention. Yeah. Yeah, no, I love that. I love that you gave that analogy. That was exactly what I was thinking in my head about, you know, three inches away from my head right now is Ben Bickman's book, Why We Get Sick. And he, he talks about the same thing. If you have a problem with the branches, don't mess with the branches, cut the damn tree down, like start there. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I'm part of, you know, I'm in order to kind of tell people about my program, I'm part of all these kinds of Facebook groups and Reddit. I am all over the place all the time trying to trying to get the word out. But there's groups on Facebook there was a one that was called brain fog for women or something. I thought, oh, this is perfect. I'm going to join this and talk to these people. And, and it is a bunch of women with severe brain fog, moderate to severe brain fog that are on hor And it's the group is made by someone who sells hormone replacement. And these women, and I get so frustrated, Casey, because I'm thinking they're giving, uh, and you can see it in the posts. People are like, oh, I still have really bad brain fog, or I'm still having terrible sleep, or I'm still having uh, irrit really bad irritability. I'm having, you know, and I've been on this medication for six months and now, and everyone's like, oh, it needs to be adjusted. Oh, it needs to be adjusted. It just needs to be adjusted. And I'm thinking that is not addressing their nutrition. That is and like, what is going on with their hormones that it's going wild? Like, are you telling me that women my age lost their minds every single time they went through this change in life? I don't think so. I don't think we would thrive. <laughs> you know, I mean, I don't, I don't think that's normal. I don't that something's going on that's causing these huge hormone imbalances. And maybe it's all the estrogenics that we're constantly exposed to. That could be it. Yeah. You know, maybe, you know, I don't know what it is, but let's do what we can to it to figure out what that is. Like we deserve root cause intervention. Um, so these women, they're suffering and I'm thinking, oh my God, you've got brain hypometabolism. Your brain can't think, your brain can't heal itself. It can't do the basic cell functions it needs to do to upkeep. And that, that progesterone you're taking is not fixing that. It's not fixing a fuel issue. It's not fixing a micronutrient in insufficiency. Sorry, I'm getting excited again. I don't know how this happens. It's, it's amazing. You're putting on an absolute clinic just like you did last time. And it's easy to get really excited about this stuff because of all the potential benefits. It's not like one thing that this can benefit. It's like it'll benefit all the things you listed and it can help you lose weight and it can help you, you know, not be diabetic and, and yeah. move well. And it's just, it's an endless amount of benefits. And so I love talking about it. Last time, we talked, you gave us a little bit of a warning for people that are trying this that are also taking medication. I wanted to just make sure we really iterate that in this conversation. What, yeah. what is your advice for somebody that is like bought in, let's do this. I, I want to get off my medication. What, yeah. what are some warnings you would have for that person? Yeah. So if you are on any kind of diabetes medication or blood pressure medication, um, anything that has anything to do with your blood sugar whatsoever, and there's a few others, uh, beta blockers, uh, things, you know, things that, things that they will often put you on for cardio. Again, cardio issues. Again, I'm not, I'm not a prescriber. Um, you need to have a prescriber available to help adjust your medications almost immediately with those. Um, and you have to have a cooperative prescriber. And if you, and if you have brain fog or, a, you know, any kind of mental health diagnosis, you very much are likely on medication um, psych psychotropic medication. And when you're on psychotropic medication, you have to have a collaborative prescriber because at some point it is very likely, not always, but very likely that you will have to begin to titrate down on some medications because as your brain health improves by doing all of these fantastic things, the dosage of medication that you are currently on will be too much and you will start to exhibit side effects of that medication. So if you are on a medication, you know, like, uh, for example, Wellbutrin, and one of the side effects is, you know, 
a side effect off of the insert. So it's great to download the side effect insert and stick it on your fridge, right? So you can kind of watch for those side effects. But you know, if you start suddenly having suicidal ideation, it might be that you are getting a side effect from, you know, like your Wellbutrin or something, and you might need to be deprescribed down or depending on the mental illness that's going on, you might need some kind of bridge medication while another medication is, is being titrated down. It's called potentiation effects. And what often will happen though, is people will go on this, you know, this very powerful metabolic psychiatry intervention, which is what a ketogenic diet is. I mean, this thing stops seizures. So, you know, um, it's, it's no joke. It's, it's not, it's not like you're just adding blueberries and salmon to like help your brain fog. Like this is, <laughs> this is the real deal. This is a really serious intervention. Not that it's dangerous, but it is a serious intervention. Um, and so, so as your brain gets healthier, you might get these potentiation effects. And what people will do though, is they'll think, oh, I'm suddenly more suicidal or I'm suddenly more, more depressed, or I'm suddenly more anxious, or I'm suddenly itchy or whatever, it must be that ketogenic diet that I'm on. When really the ketogenic diet is improving their brain health in such a way that the medication dosage they're currently on is giving them side effects. And it's pretty easy, like a, a, a well-educated prescriber about ketogenic diets will know, oh, we need to just reduce your dose for a couple of days and see what happens. And then if that's the case, then, you know, maybe you know, we know that that's it. And if not, then, you know, yeah, we'll up your medication or we'll figure out what works for you. But yeah. what usually happens and is really frustrating and a little scary for me as someone who helps people transition to ketogenic diets is they will say, oh, I'm, you know, I've got this side effect. I've got more anxiety or I've got more whatever, which are side effects of too high of doses of psychiatric medications. Right. Um, they'll add a medication. And here I'm thinking, oh my gosh, your brain is actually working better. What is that new medication going to add, right, to what's going on for you? And so, so yeah, we need more prescribers working yeah. on it. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's great. I love just the idea of having a warning that we're going to have to get you off of your medication. Like that to me is like least exciting. And it must be exciting for all the people you work with that have been on these terrible medications for so long. Just the thought of like, wow, I, I might be able to get off of these. Fantastic. Um, yeah. Before we let you go, I do want to ask you about something you brought up briefly earlier in this conversation, your most recent blog post about leaky brain. I've heard of leaky gut. I, it was really fun to learn about leaky brain. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So just like your, you know, just like your gut has to have these tight junctions to keep things where they belong and not cause an immune response. Um, so does your brain and your, your, it's called the blood brain barrier, BBB for short. And, um, it is really important that it is nice and healthy and it needs tight junctions. And a lot of people, um, if you don't have tight junctions, things get up in there and they float around in your brain. And then I'm, I'm explaining this super simple, but you know, your immune system reacts to that because it knows it doesn't belong there and it's not supposed to be there. Um, and it can cause damage. It lets damaging things get up into your brain. Um, and as you can imagine, that can cause a lot of inflammation and oxidative stress. And so part of being, having a healthy brain is being able to keep things out. And so um, what a lot of people don't know is they'll talk a lot about their leaky gut, the leaky gut, I have depression because I have leaky gut. Well, if you have leaky gut and your functional medicine person has, you know, biomarkers to confirm that you have leaky gut, then you have leaky brain. And, um, and I, I think that ketogenic diets do amazing things in terms of healing both of those. The, uh, the blood brain barrier is made of these little, it, it, it's, a, it's a membrane with um, a vascular membrane. And then it also has these astrocytes in there and they love ketones. They literally awesome. make their own ketones. Wow. They like them so much. They need them so much. They use them. And then if you give them more, they can do more. <laughs> That's amazing. Right? Yeah. Wow. So if you want to heal, you want to heal things up, you know, you've got to, it, it you got to give those cells the fuels that they want. And I'm sorry, I don't think it's glucose. It's not. 
Yeah, I completely agree. This has been another amazing conversation. I always learn something when I get to talk with you. Um, you're so generous with your time and always learning new things and teaching it um, on your website, on your blog, and with your courses. Where do you want people to go to find you to connect with you and your work? Uh, they can. The easiest place is my mentalhealthketo.com uh, website. There's a form where you can just go ahead and email me. I am on Instagram. Um, mental health keto. I have a bunch of different names. Keto keto counselor. I'm on Twitter. I'm just all over. Just look up Nicole Laurent LMHC and I will pop up in some way, shape or form on awesome. Reddit on on all of them. Um, and, and yeah, just write me an email. That's easiest. Awesome. Great. We will link to all of that in the show notes. And I can confirm that you are very active on all the social media platforms. It seems not a day go by that I'm not liking one of your things. You're liking one of my things. And it's yeah. always fun to see you out there. Yeah. <laughs> That's Good. great. Awesome. Nicole Laurent, thank you so very much for everything that you're doing in this space. Thank you for bringing all your passion and excitement to the conversation. And thank you for bringing that passion and excitement to our conversation today. We really appreciate you. Yeah, I loved being here. Thank you so much. Such an honor. And this has been another episode of Boundless Body Radio.